Movies are stories and stories are worth engaging for Christians. Uh, these movies that are all around us today and that have been parts of our past, even artifacts of our own personal history, uh, are part of how we, we process reality and how we think about truth and goodness and beauty and ultimately uh, how we see our heart's greatest longings satisfied in God and his son. Uh, welcome to Grace and Truth. My name is Owen Strand, and uh, I have convened a second episode of the Grace and Truth Movie Club with my friend Joel Berry. He's the managing editor of the Babylon Bee. We haven't even talked about the Babylon Bee, which is a whole thing <laughs> unto itself, a, a, an excellent work and the funniest uh, website out there. But uh, I, I've I've kind of kidnapped uh, Joel's mind, and I'm I'm forcing him <laughs> to talk about fun movies with me. So, Joel, thank you for being back thank on. You. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. We we had an earlier episode that I'm guessing a bunch of you watched where we broke down some elements of Dune Part 2. I think it was mildly, it was a lot of fun for me. Uh, Joel is a very deep thinker, but it was also very frustrating because I know there's a ton I'm not getting to and we're not getting to. So um, what I wanted to do here in this episode with you, Joel, is is talk through a little more of Dune Part 2, more more the, the atmospherics, the visuals, the audio. How did the movie as a movie strike you? That's where I'd like to go first. And then I'd like us, if it if it's good by you, to just transition into some other great guy movies or epic movies um, that, that you and I think can can form a conversation, drive people to think about meaning, goodness, truth, beauty, et cetera, and so on. How does that sound to you? Sounds good. Let's do it. So what I thought with Dune Part 2 is uh, just in terms of movies in 2024, I'm not talking now about worldview. I'm not talking even about morality per se. I just was very encouraged, frankly, as somebody who adores movies. I watch them carefully, biblically as a Christian. I try to imperfectly. But I was really encouraged to see a, a film swinging for the fences, not in a kind of super CGI form. Uh, the director, Denis Villeneuve, or however you say his name, um, <laughs> yep. clearly he doesn't just want to plot. In fact, I actually think he might think first about visuals and staging and those sorts of yes. things. And, and he's working with a plot. But I loved the feel, the weight, the look, the shots of Dune. Did you? Part two. I, I, yeah. I, yeah. I absolutely loved it. I, um, I, saw it on the the biggest screen I could. Um, it's one of those movies and part one was this way too. Um, it's one of those movies you, you watch, you leave the theater and then you find yourself like dreaming about it. it you just like for the next week, you just find yourself thinking in these images, these incredible visuals, um, the sound just reverberating in your chest. And, you know, Denis Villeneuve is a, is a very, I mean, a visual storyteller. He he keeps his dialogue to an absolute minimum yes. needed to tell the story. And and with Dune, with as much exposition and backstory and and world building, lore building that there is is, is required, quite a challenge to tell a story with minimal dialogue. But he he really did it. Um, and it is. I mean, the 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 opening sequence in particular, the um, the Harkonnen attack with the uh, like the the floating soldiers uh, yes. on top of that Mesa, just absolutely breathtaking. Yes. Um, and, and thrilling. And, um, I, the, the attention to detail, I think as well. I mean, those, those little details, um, when it comes to, you know, equipment, um, you know, the way it actually works and functions, um, it really does immerse you in the world. Um, in a way that just most movies don't nowadays. You, most mm -hmm. of them are CGI fests. And so I, it's really, mm -hmm. it is really cool to see someone putting that much love and intention and care into, into crafting a world and really just immersing you in it. Yeah. You can tell that he obviously uses CGI because, you know, people can't actually float upwards and, and around and that sort of thing. <laughs> but I was, I was really, um, I found it really markedly interesting in a very Christopher Nolan way where he will use CGI a little in a way that I think is actually, I mean, look, we're watching movies. Mm -hmm. You can use a little bit of CGI. I would say I'm kind of a traditionalist yeah. and a purist in that respect, more on that side, but you can use some, yeah. I mean, these are moving pictures and yet he, he very strongly seems, and I've read some interviews and stuff. So I think this is generally true to resist what you could call the marvelization 
uh, of action mm -hmm. and adventure and sci-fi. He wants you to feel the weight of a, of a sword blow. And he wants you to, mm -hmm. to see in a realistic way how, you know, you might travel up. And he wants you to feel the, the sandworm, the shy halud hitting the earth, mm -hmm. you know, with a tremendous bang. And so, um, and he also loves staging like entrances and greetings. I, I recently watched the Star Wars films with my family, with my wife and three kids. And so we've gotten them into Star Wars and um, in a careful way. And uh, it, it struck me how similar, I guess George Lucas wasn't technically the director really, but how similar Lucas's vision was uh, for like grand entrances and pageantry and staging. Mm. And I don't even think anybody cares about these things really anymore. We take visual images so for granted now, but the director yeah. of Dune is a master uh, at images and staging, I would say. He, yeah, he really is. It really, I, I, I haven't seen anything like it. Um, and I mean, he has, he has some other good films too. Um, I mean, he's, he's excellent at staging, excellent at tension. Um, the way he can he can hold your attention, you know, on an image where maybe nothing necessarily is happening, uh, like plot wise, or or just to to keep you immersed in a beautiful image that lingers a little bit longer than most movies do. If you're used to you know Marvel and Michael Bay, um, you, you really do just get the sense you can sit back and just take it all in, drink it all in. It's, it is it, when when we're talking about visual art, um, you know. Back in the Middle Ages, you know, you had Michelangelo, you had the great painters and, and, and the beautiful sculptures. I think most of the, the great visual art that you see, you don't see it in museums anymore. It's, it's all modern art garbage. Yeah. Where, where you see it is in movies like Dune 2 and you see it in video games too. A, a lot of the just mm. the absolute beautiful and imaginative, um, you know, paintings and, and work. Mm. Um, that are just beautiful to look at for their own sake. Uh, that's where you're seeing it now in, in movies like this. Yeah. What, um, what did you think about, um, the Harkonnen? What did you think about, uh, the, the end stages with, uh, with the scenes of, of violence and combat, what stands out to you, yeah. I guess, in general, in terms of shot making and <clears throat> scenes from Dune part two, before we move on yeah. to other movies? Well, there's a there's a brilliant scene uh, about halfway through where uh, the Harkonnens have this kind of gladiatorial uh, battle, mm. um, and um, and it's brutal and violent, and just you get this sense of foreboding and evil. Mm. Um, but it's filmed in infrared, which, I mean, just it created this mood. I, I, I it's hard to describe it you can almost feel the heat radiating off the screen as you're watching it it just feels hot because it, yes. it's filmed it's not filmed in black and white it's filmed in infrared which is slightly different yes um and that was that was fascinating um the um the harkonnens i mean uh, you know true to a classic myth i mean they're filmed and you know they're all in dark corridors they're all pale and there's they're irredeemably vile and gross i mean they're they're like the orcs from lord of the rings you know they're just there's nothing good about about these guys yes um which is it's nice it's nice to see it like like strictly delineated good and evil in, in, in a movie um where where those lines aren't confused the 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 tension between, for example, the infrared Harkonnen fight scene with Fade Rautha uh, vanquishing these these three unfortunate souls, and then you, if we can jump out as we've been doing, if we can jump out and go to um, the Shire in in yeah. the Lord of the Rings movies, in particular, uh, in the Hobbit movies, I guess as well. But I'm thinking in particular of Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, if I can do this for a second, I want to hear what you think, but. You've got um, you've got the Shire with its peace, its uh, its beauty in a, in a in a you know basic way. It's not ornate beauty; it's natural beauty, right? Uh, the beauty of of the rolling hills and the grass and the trees, and and that's so much of what captivated Tolkien. Uh, he he lived mm -hmm. in Oxford and got to be in one of the world's most beautiful places. But he really loved natural beauty, God made beauty, the trees and so on, mm -hmm. waters, and, and and there's such a peace and a tranquility. And a happiness uh, that coheres in the vision of the Shire, uh, and of course, that's all threatened by by the darkness and Lord of the Rings. Right, that's the central device. But you contrast that with what you brought out there a minute ago with the Harkonnen world, 
the Harkonnen world is an intense world. It, it is a feverish world. All the people, probably a lot of them CGI, are, you know, chanting horrible things. Their language sounds very strange. There is no rest, joy, tranquility, peace, beauty. There's no beauty in the Harkonnen yeah. world, except for ha perhaps a terrible beauty or something like that, you could call it. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's some of what the director is after that, not, not that he's, he's, con he's, uh, consciously thinking of the Shire, but you can contrast this vision and, and, and you're getting a picture of what the world can look like without grace and mercy, I think. No, it's, it's true. And I, well, and that's what makes me wish that Denis Villeneuve would have just embraced the Christ story and myth with this whole thing. Cause I mean, that's visually, that's the story he's telling, you know, mm. it, uh, um, and that's why the, the, the whole story seems so confused to me. You know, you're painting this, you're trying to tell this real human drama game of Thrones type story where messiahs are liars and, and, and things like that, but you're doing it kind of with the trappings of myth and the visuals of, of start good and evil. You know, yes. one of the other points that I had in my, my re review on Twitter was that, you know, if you're going to tell a game of Thrones style story, if you're going to tell a human a grounded human drama, you should, you should give the Harkonnen side of the story. You shouldn't be, tr you know, painting them as irredeemable, you know, orc type creatures. Uh, you should be, um, you should be making, giving them sympathetic characters and their own narrative for the things that the reasons that they're doing what they're doing. Um, and Denny didn't do that because Frank Herbert doesn't do that in his book either. Right. I mean, the Harkonnens are horrible in the book. Um, so all that, all I'm saying is my point is that just the fact that there's this weird tension between kind of like a grounded human drama with the trappings of myth is why people take this story so differently. Some people embrace the myth. Some people embrace the human drama. Some people kind of yeah. embrace a mixture of both. But I, I do just love for its own sake. I love the, the stark visual representation of what what evil look it really is like a just a vision of hell yeah. um what what a what a world without god um would look like and and for that reason i just love that yeah and that is a valuable thing to to see and think through and and um and that's part of what movies can help us do stories can help us do we can we can imagine worlds a world without god a society without god uh we have seen versions of that in the 20th century for example and uh and it, it is a terrible thing um okay let's transition a little bit here um now since i have your time uh having having captured your time here for just a little bit um yeah. Let's talk about other movies that uh, we could call them um, great guy movies, the guy movie pantheon, but we don't even have to, to genderize it to sound inclusive for a minute. Um, it, it could just be a movie that, that moves you deeply. I'm going to go first, so I won't launch it at you first. Uh, I don't know if this is a film that you, are, you track with. I think it is, if I recall correctly, but Master and Commander, is that a film oh. that, that you like? I love that movie so much. Why? <laughs> Why? I <sighs> um, it is for one, it's, it's just an incredibly, uh, be beautifully shot and staged representation of what, uh, I mean, uh, what I, what I imagine like the Napoleonic war British seafaring, uh, would have been like, I mean, it is like <laughs> gritty, like there's not like any kind of movie sheen on it. You feel like you're on this ship yes. and it is brutal and the, I mean, you see the, the maggots and the bread and the, you know, the people with their being, having their legs amputated. And, um, it is, it is so just realistic. Um, and it, it's also just a great study on, on leadership, mm -hmm. um, what it is to, to lead men, um, into, into danger, into battle, um, to do it for a cause that's greater than yourself, um, you know, the fact that, you know, these, you have these boys basically who are on the other side of the world chasing down this French ship, you know, like, and they're probably going to die, many of them. And, and the captain has to, to rally them and, and remind them of, of what, for what they're fighting and, and just the portrayal of, of masculine honor, um, is just awesome. I want to go watch it right now. Actually, I haven't seen it in a while. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. I, I've, I've long in my head. I've, I've had. To, if any filmmakers out there want to pick this up, because I might not have time with all my B, Babylon B stuff. But um, there was a 
there was a squadron after the abolition of slavery that was tasked with tracking down sh- slave ships off the coast of West Africa and freeing mm. slaves. And they freed over like 230,000 slaves. Thousands of British uh, seamen uh, died uh, at sea to, to free slaves. I mean, this was a campaign that lasted years and years. Yeah. Um, I would love to see a master and commander style movie like Bro. to tell telling that story would be so cool. That sounds fire. I would. Oh, That'd man. That'd be awesome. <laughs> sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a yeah, good one. I, we'll get back to our discussion in just a second. I want to just say something that's very important to us all. And it's this. At the very heart of our democracy lies a principle we hold sacred, free speech. It's the cornerstone that supports every freedom we cherish. Yet in today's digital age, discussions about our wealth, our rights, and our future are being silenced or overshadowed in mainstream narratives, leaving many feeling voiceless in conversations that are crucial to our financial independence and security. This is where wealth protection research steps in. It's armed with a mission that's never been more critical. Wealth protection research is not a financial advisory firm. They are defenders of free speech committed to giving a voice to the silenced. Wealth protection research tirelessly seeks out financial experts. These are the voices that challenge prevailing narratives, especially as we all navigate the uncertainties of the 2024 election. Wealth protection research has created a 2024 election wealth protection report. This free report highlights the three best ideas for protecting and growing your money heading into the 2024 election. It contains ideas the mainstream media won't touch and listeners can get it completely free. Text ideas, one word, ideas to 76626 to claim your free copy. If you believe in the sanctity of free speech and the importance of financial freedom, then act now. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy of this 2024 Election Protection Report. It's time to widen the scope of what we're told, to hear the ideas the establishment does not think you can handle, and to take control of our financial destinies. Text IDEAS to 76626 to claim your free copy copy. I very much encourage you to do this because I very much support free speech and a free society. God bless you. Back to our discussion. I've got to agree completely and utterly with you. Uh, I think I've said with just a touch of hyperbole that I think Master and Commander is the most underrated movie ever. But honestly, even as those words escape my lips, it's not a really mainstream film. It wasn't really known. It did make about $220 million on a $150 million budget. If you know Hollywood, you know that's probably about a break-even proposition, uh, even though it sounds mm-hmm. better than that. But, um, uh, but of course, there's a lot of, there's a lot of books in the Patrick O'Brien series that they could have sourced. The, the amazing thing to me is that it's, it's a Peter Ware movie and people have no idea the gene, the genius of Peter. He's one Ware. of the greats. He is one yeah. of the greats, but he to this yep. minute is almost unknown. Uh, as a great filmmaker, um, there's another film that you can find on Amazon Prime uh, for free, basically. It's called The Way Back. It's not the Ben Affleck basketball coach drinking mm-hmm. story, which I haven't seen. That might be a good film, too. It's not that. It's a film about prisoners escaping from Siberia in World War II and fighting to live. And and this movie, The Way Back by Peter Ware, W-E-I-R, Australian director is amazing. It's an amazing study. Peter Ware made the Truman show. Peter Ware made picnic at hanging rock. Um, he's, he, I would just say he's the director, the great director, the auteur, the auteur mm-hmm. that people don't know about, which is tragic. Yeah, he, he really, and he hasn't made one in a while. I, I've, I've often wondered if he's got something cooking or if he's done, but, um, master and commander, I think was kind of his last big one. He may have done one smaller one since then, but, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's one of the greats for sure. Master and commander, uh, as you brought out a minute ago, pictures a world where, uh, there's, there's order, there's, um, decorum, there are habits, yes. there are traditions, and I suspect it was the greatest culture that's ever existed on the face of the earth. Uh, it's a, we look back to that. I mean, the, the British empire, yeah. um, produced some of the greatest culture that's ever existed. Um, yeah. and yeah, <laughs> yeah, it did. It, it definitely produced some of, some of it. You're, you're right. I agree. And, and, um, what you find in that, in that movie is, um, a, a major confrontation really 
between um, the traditional worldview, what is sometimes called the Judeo-Christian worldview, you can call it what you want, I'll call it the traditional paradigm, versus mm -hmm. the emerging uh, uh, liberal paradigm, I don't mean, uh, I don't mean political philosophy liberal, I mean leftist mm -hmm. paradigm, let's just call it that, uh, for yep. shorthand. And so you've got, you've got uh, Captain Jack, Lucky Jack, uh, who, who is basically personifying a form of Horatio Nelson, Admiral Nelson, the famous Admiral, Admiral uh, who was mm -hmm. universally admired in Britain and an incredible seaman and fighter and leader of men. So this is Russell Crowe basically getting a shot at portraying Admiral Nelson. By the way, in terms of another movie that should be made, it's insane to me. It makes perfect sense in this anti- imperial age or whatever but it's insane to me that there is no 10-part biopic on admiral nelson i mean one of the most complex and fascinating and successful figures hmm. in history uh just an incredible hmm. leader and fighter but i digress hmm. anyway you, so, so you've got <laughs> captain jack traditional and then you've got the doctor who's yep. sort of an evolutionist and 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 thinks that men shouldn't really be governed very much and and so yeah, he's the you, trendy thinker He's the trendy thinker. Yeah. So Peter Ware sets up not just, it's not just a film about the English chasing the French in a bunch of battle scenes. It's deceptively a film about political philosophy and about the nature of man. Can man, will man flourish mm -hmm. when man is ungoverned and left to his passions or will man flourish when he is governed and led imperfectly um, by others? Yeah. And what I appreciated about the way that that was portrayed is that, um, it, it's the it's portrayed honesty or honestly the conversation is honest and and both sides are are kind of steel manned as opposed to straw man you know like mm. both of these guys kind of make their cases well um and you yes. don't get the sense that peter ware, ware has one idea that he he's gonna he's gonna write the script in such a way to where you know one side wins and makes the other one look stupid it's just it's just a very uh very well written uh, conversation uh, between these two friends yes. who who disagree on these things, and the the viewers kind of left to um, to come to their own conclusion, which is that's that's great art right there. It is, and where shows you the value of a life in a few different instances in Master and Commander. You've got the the seaman who who Captain Jack is trying valiantly to save, who's adrift at sea, um, but his his salvation, his rescue, is putting the entire ship. Uh, in danger. And so ultimately, uh, cord by cord, uh, the seaman has to be left to drift to his death. So you feel the weight of a single human life. You feel that as well with the with Hollum, the, the young officer of sorts who can't can't lead men and fails and then commits mm -hmm. suicide. So you're really getting a sense of the gravity of of one human life. Do you think that's mm -hmm. accurate? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, in a, in a, in a world where you would think, uh, human life would be cheap, where people are just dying left and right. You, you get a much greater sense of the value of a human life in that world than ironically than today, which yeah. is, which is saying something. All right. Throw one at me, throw, throw out a movie that you <laughs> think we should, we should briefly chat about here in our last 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, well, I don't know. I, you know, I, I've been thinking about this a lot because I, um, you know, I have a boys who are 11 years old and I've been watching movies with them and kind of talking through them. And we've, uh, we just did Lord of the Rings uh, for the first time, uh, together over Christmas and they, they loved it. Um, mm. and, and, uh, I, I've kind of with the boys, I've focused on some of those more like mythical stories, um, star, the, the old star Wars, um, the, the the very early phase one Marvel movies are great studies in like what makes a good man. You know, mm -hmm. um, I, I like how, you know, Iron Man um, has to kind of learn a lesson and become a, a man of a man of integrity before he be, can become a hero. Um, Captain America is already a man of integrity, but he doesn't have the strength and competence yet to be the mm -hmm. hero he needs to be. So like in mm -hmm. each of these stories, you kind of have a, a man who is missing something that he needs to get. Um, hmm. and I, I love those, uh, uh, just as in terms of being studies about what it is to be a, a hero or, or a great man or a leader. Um, but when it comes to the, like the quintessential guy, it, this isn't really a movie, so I might be cheating. Hmm. Um, I really appreciate band of brothers. Um, oh, and it's, yeah. 
something you should watch carefully because there's probably some, th- you know, if you have angel, uh, what is it? Uh, angel vid. Uh, vid angel, angel or something like that. Yeah. Um, you might want to watch it with that. Um, but um, I think it's the quintessential uh, World War II portrayal. Um, mm. um, it, it covers everything from, you know, from leadership to courage and cowardice, um, uh, camaraderie uh, between between brothers and in and, and arms, um, how the war was fought, why the war was fought. It really just covers the whole thing. And when my boys are old enough, I look forward to to, to watching it with them because uh, I, I really just think it just it, it perfectly encapsulates um, just everything, um, yeah. I, you know, uh, what war is, um, the idea of a, of a just war um, and uh, what it takes to to lead regular men, um, often scared men, mm. um, into battle and to give them courage, um, and, and to, you know, to lay down your life for your men, a good leader, um, sacrifices, uh, for, for his men, um, band of brothers mm. just hit, it kind of does it all. Um, mm. which again, it's like a 10 episode miniseries. So maybe that's cheating, but, but it does a good job. That is not cheating. The, the Bureau on movie discussion has, ruled and said that is a tremendous uh uh uh, submission yeah it strikes me that our generation you know has to look back at these films because we are in this weird plastic anything goes amorphous orderless boundaryless age and so gnostic yeah gnostic so we look back weirdly pining for the days of world war ii which was absolutely horrific uh, on mm-hmm. a global scale. I mean, it, it, it impacted everyone's life. You literally couldn't put butter on your bread most days of the week, for example. I mean, how about a consequence there? Um, yeah. So it took a lot of the color out of life. I mean, Britain didn't recover uh, to, to pre-war levels of food until the mid 1950s, for example. So we think, you know, 1945, yay, May, June, the war ends, happy days. That that war had so many consequences, but but I'm digressing. Yeah. Fundamentally, our men, but not just men, men and women watch these films that we're talking about in part for many reasons or, or series in the case of Band of Brothers, in part because there is order, there is structure, um, there is leadership. It's it's good authority. Uh, Captain Winners, Richard Winners, uh, uh, portrayed by Damian Lewis, amazing performance, very kind of Eastwoodian performance where he's almost cutting his lines. He 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 says almost nothing in his episodes, mm-hmm. but that makes you hone in on Captain Winners' direction and courage and lines and encouragement. And and, and so we're having to go back. I, I find myself going back to these films and these series to to really learn manhood. Um, from yeah. a, a generation we've had manhood ripped away from us and not yes. taught to us. And so we have yes. to, in many cases, go to mini series and movies to try to find it in a sense. That's, that's very true. Um, I, I think about what it's going to take for us to get, get that back. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, you know, I don't like any of the answers cause they all look like, you know, we're going to have to face some kind of calamity, um, mm. Uh, and hardship together uh, before we figured out, but that's you know that seems to be the 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 history of the world. You know the the whole hard men create good times, good times create soft men, soft men create hard times, and the whole cycle continues. Yes, um, I I think that we're we're definitely heading there. I think part of the charm of looking back at some of these old movies, you know, with the structure and the discipline and and the culture, mm-hmm. is that. In times of hardship, um, reality is undeniable. Mm. Um, when you, when you live in a, a time of plenty and wealth and uh, insulation from the consequences of your action, mm. um, there's this like this fakeness to it, um, mm. and there's this it's it's harder to, to get a sense of what's real. Whereas when all that is stripped away, um, <laughs> the truth of what the world is, uh, is just in your face and it's completely undeniable. And I think part of, part of the, the, the looking back, uh, at, at history is, is, uh, not just a, a search for masculine role models and, and understanding how to be masculine. It's a search for right. truth. It's like, you know, w- what is real in this fake plastic world that we live in? Mm. I think that's very well said. What is one moment that stands out to you that grabs you or grips you from Band of Brothers as you reflect on it? Um, 
if you need me to go first, I can go first. <laughs> yeah, you go first. I got to think. I don't want to be unfair to my guests here on air. What I would say is Lieutenant Spears in episode seven. I just had it ready. Sorry. Um, because everyone is paralyzed uh, as as the forces of Easy Company are supposed to be taking this town. And uh, the commander loses his nerve, uh, uh, loses oh. his ability to issue orders and instructions to his troops. His troops are getting pounded. The Germans then are in, are, in, are increasingly, if I could talk English, citing the men with their mortars and hitting them successfully. It's a disaster. It's a debacle. It's a lot like living uh, in, in America in 2024 in that sense. And yet here comes this uh, complex figure, shadowy figure but who in this moment is is incredibly courageous, shows courage throughout the series, but incredibly courageous, runs on the battlefield, risks death, um, shows up, issues orders to people, takes command of the situation and and saves the day. And here's what I would say about that moment. Here's what it, it speaks to me. Um, it, it, it It's not that we need men who who are brash and, you know, sort of puff their chest out and are chauvinistic or something like that today. Uh, it's that we need, we do need clear, stable, decisive, calm, courageous, convictional men, um, in the church and in society who, who show up in terrible situations and help people. And, uh, of course, in, in, in the Christian sense, that looks not just like do this or do that. It looks like discipleship. It looks like investing in people and, and helping them and as men investing in the next mm. generation of young men and as women investing in the next generation of young women, mm. training them to know Christ by the power of God's grace. But such a powerful visual scene of chaos, which mm. is what today feels like in a lot of senses, and then a strong man who comes in and helps. That's good. That's really good. I love that part, too. Um, I This is... I think this is the part that the, one of the parts that moves me uh, the most, and it's it's actually one of the earliest parts. Um, I wish I could remember the names of all these characters, but the the first episode kind of covers their their training, their basic training to you know, and they have this um, this platoon commander who's just an absolute like he's a jerk, you know. Um, they hate this guy; he's terrible to them. Yes. Um, you know, he's kind of a tool. Um, when they go out into the field and they're doing these field exercises, he's, he's incompetent and he like, he can't remember where he is on the map and he gets lost. And they realize like, if this guy leads us into combat, people are going to get killed. Yes. Um, there's this scene towards the end of either the first episode or maybe the second episode where, you know, the, you know, easy company realizes like, if, if we don't get this guy out of our command, then like, we're going to be in danger you know and so they yes. kind of have this mutiny and they and they um it comes to the attention of the the commander of the base um and the commander of the base realizes that this this man this platoon commander has kind of lost the respect of his men and um um and he reassigns him and um this general or this commander, he's an older kind of a grizzled war veteran, World War One veteran guy, you know, and, and mm -hmm. he the way he um, the way he reassigned this this easy company commander. Um, well, the way he did it with tact and firmness um, without denigrating him um, and at the same time, re you know, recognizing what. Um, where his shortcomings are and why this man couldn't go into combat, but at the same time recognizing uh, his value because yes. his value was that he was, he, he trained his company better than anybody else. Yes. And he realized that this man had value as a, as a, a trainer. So he's like, you're going to be in command of, of training. You're going to be in yeah. charge of this. So like, and he, the way he skillfully sold it as like, this is a, this is a good thing for you. This is a promotion. It was gentle. It was firm. Mm. It was tactful. Mm. Um, and, and and you and then you see at the same time that this guy who everyone hates that's kind of a tool even he has value he has strength he has god given strengths and he has his own place in the picture yeah. um you know in 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 the war effort and so i i think part of part of it was i i think i related to this this guy a little bit this tool maybe i'm a little too self critical but you know i just um <laughs> The, the, the feeling of incompetence, I think, sometimes, or, or, or being accident-prone, 
I was in the military. I was, I was kind of known as the, the gentle guy with no killer instinct that would, you know, would, I would drop my rifle, you know, a lot, you know, (laughs) like, like that was the, you know, I'm not a soldier, you know, I'm not a, and, um, and so I think just, just the message that, that no matter who you are, um, God has given you something, um, that is, that is of value that can be used for his, his, his purpose and his glory, um, in this, in this grander effort. And I guess I'm, uh, I, I proved the point. I, I'm, uh, I, God ended up using me to write silly jokes on the internet. So <laughs> here I am. Well, yes, I'm very thankful he has. And, and your work is having a, a major effect, honestly, uh, in skewering so much that needs to be skewered and actually pointing people to reality and to truth. Uh, we're in this mm-hmm. weird moment where a humor site speaks a lot more truth than news outlets and that sort of thing. And, and even from a Christian standpoint, so I'm very thankful for your work and for you. And just in wrapping, uh, wrapping up, concluding, I would say absolutely. I mean, that's a wonderful picture of how men fail and women fail too. But, you know, just keeping the conversation on men for a minute. Mm. So many men today, Joel, are failing. So many men mm. are doing badly. Their marriages are not going great. Their fatherhood is not going great, or they're single and they're struggling with this, that, and the other. They're, they're listless in their job. And a lot of men out there feel hopeless and feel purposeless and meaningless. And hmm. um, what you covered there in that scene reminds us, in particular, as Christian men, of how God does not go, you stupid idiot. You are so yes. accident prone. Uh, I have no use for you. Get out of here for guy or girl alike. God takes those of us who have broken things, who have failed, who do sin on a daily basis. And he says, here's my grace. Here's my mercy. Here's purpose for you. And it may not be uh, winning the war single handedly. The purpose God gives us may be very humble and and mm-hmm. and, and despised and seems small mm-hmm. and anonymous. But if we do it for God's glory, it's not small. It, it matters. Amen. That's good. Amen. I love that. That's a great scene to bring out. All right. Well, my guest has been Joel Berry. He's been very generous with his time. Thank you, Joel, for being on not one, but two. You're now a two episode (laughs) guest and I I hope and you got it. So I hope you'll come back on and, and do movie club with me again, if you would be so kind. I'd love to this. I, you, you might be able to tell, I love talking about this more than, than politics. So any, any, any chance I get to have a kind of a palate cleanser and talk movies, uh, I'm game. I'll, I'll be here Excellent. for Dune part three for sure. All right. Well, we'll put it on the calendar <laughs> for roughly 18 years from now, Dune part three. <laughs> So my guest today has been Joel Berry, managing editor of the Babylon Bee. In all seriousness, it's been tremendous fun having him on to the podcast to talk movies. We as Christians want to think uh, well, biblically, about all of life. That includes engaging media and material that isn't necessarily Christian, but trying to think through it from a biblical standpoint, a biblical worldview, with the grace and truth of Jesus Christ at the forefront. Thank you for listening, and God bless you.